Um, so this talk is probably going to be a little different from most other talks here, and that's because uh, I am an engineer by training. I work in the Royal School of Mines, which is part of the Department of Material Science and Engineering at Imperial College London. And I've just started working on verification and things like that a couple of years ago. And I had a couple of people asking me in the past few days, so um, why am I here? Um, and I want to spend the next two slides uh, sort of motivating what makes us uh, work on this kind of topic. Um, so um, there is talk in our field of an um, impeding correctness crisis. I haven't made this word up. This appears in the title of a US Department of Energy report, um, along with the claim that if we don't find uh, like radical new ways in scientific computing to establish correctness in our software, then we are not going to be able to target the next generation hardware effectively. And I don't think I need to convince anyone here that uh, establishing correctness of software is uh, both important and very hard. But um, there are perhaps things that make it uh, even more important and even harder in high performance computing and, and scientific computing. Um, so like, some of the challenges that we are facing is that we have very large scale computations, um, both in the size of the problems that we are trying to solve, as well as the, the software that we're using, used on large scale <coughs> systems that are evolving quickly. We have new hardware coming in all the time. People want to use GPUs, people want to use Intel Xeon Phi, many core processors, vectorization. Uh, ARM is coming up with new high performance computing hardware, which has yet another model of uh, vectorization, and someone needs to write software for all this or port existing software to all these things. Um, and um, of course, bugs get introduced in the process. Um, of course, we're dealing with floating point computations, and there are lots of non-intuitive problems with those. Um, and one challenge is that uh, high performance computing applications um, pretty much all the time mix knowledge from various domains into one piece of software. So you have someone who knows about, um, I don't know, seismic imaging, weather forecasting or something, but then self-taught themselves how to write Fortran and started developing a code uh, and sort of introduced parallelism and all these things. And it's really hard to find stuff that is able to sort of understand all these fields involved um, and, and reason about the codes that we are using. Um, and then in many cases, performance is really important and it's um, often of deemed much more important than even readability. Um, so we have a problem with code that is poorly documented. Um, uh, saying that it isn't well specified is really an underestimation. So, so often the documentation doesn't exist and the code is its own documentation. And so by definition, anything that the code does is correct, unless of course there's a bug and then it's not correct. And um, not all bugs lead to detectable safety violations, of course, so very often the problems that we are facing are not crashes or things like, I don't know, two systems have a token where only one should have one or something, but the problem is that we just produce, so we silently produce wrong outputs, and those wrong outputs may look correct or plausible even to experts, so you can you can you can introduce race conditions in a weather forecasting code or something like this, and you might just predict the wrong weather, but you won't be facing any like obviously wrong images. It might look correct. Um, and then, of course, we have the problem that the results are often non-deterministic because we have something like parallel sum reductions, where if we run it again the next day, the results are different. And it's very hard to distinguish whether the difference in result is just because of the non-associativity of floating point numbers or because maybe there's a, a race condition in the code and sometimes we are just omitting some terms and sometimes we aren't. Um, and it's really hard to, to distinguish these in practice. Okay, having said all this, um, so we have a like deep, uh, dark cavern, uh, and we're trying to shine a little bit of light into this. Um, I don't think that we're going to solve all these problems. Um, certainly, we haven't solved all these problems. Um, but like, a few steps that we wanted to take with, with our current project is um, we want to 
start and find some ways to distinguish round of errors from sort of other sorts of bugs. Um, that's not to say that problems with round of are not bugs, they certainly are, but at least it's good to know which ones which and sort of to be, to be able to distinguish so that you know what you have to fix. Um, and we need some way to, to sanity check programs even though they are poorly specified. And uh, ideally we would like to be able to do this without sort of going all the way into sort of the, the language that, that formal verification people use because we tend to reason about things in terms of linear algebra, we have derivatives, we have matrix prop properties like regular matrices and things like this. And so hopefully we would be able to specify what a program is supposed to do in terms of these, uh, in terms of these things. So one, one thing that the project that funds me has been doing for a while is to try and attempt to specify what a program is supposed to do only relative to another program. So that might be that you're trying to um, compare a program before some performance optimization to the same program after some performance optimization. And even though you don't really have a clear idea of what the program does, at least it's supposed to do the same thing as it did before. And in this particular work, um, we are taking it a little step further, let's say, um, and, uh, and that is to, to say, in some cases, we don't really know what a program is doing, but we know that some other program is supposed to compute the derivative of that original program. And we actually have plenty of examples for this. Um, and so we just try to um, sort of find, find a way to, to verify this particular technique, just as sort of one uh, verifying one particular property of, of these programs. And so, um, yeah, to talk about this, um, I will have to introduce a couple of things first. Um, um, there's a technique that we're using a lot, which is called algorithmic differentiation. I have a slide on this. Uh, then the verification was done with the civil verification tool. Um, probably not everyone knows this, so I will, I will um, go into that a bit. Um, civil has a perhaps unusual notion of uh, what a floating point number is, um, so I'm going to talk about different ways of dealing with those. And then I have two test cases that I'm going to show. Our paper actually has a third test case, which I'm skipping in this presentation just for time reason. Okay, so just uh, like whirlwind tour through automatic differentiation. Actually, AD is uh, sort of another community about as big as this one here with regular conferences and all this. Um, I've condensed uh, uh, 40 years of work into one slide here. So it's, it's a technique for computing analytic derivatives of programs and the way it usually works is that you take one program that computes some function and you transform that into a different program that computes the derivative of the original program. But the, the target program that you are generating is often just plain old code, so, so it's usually implemented as a source-to-source -source transformation where you stick a piece of Fortran code in and a piece of Fortran code comes out, or C code goes in and C code, code goes out. And they are used in a lot of things, optimization, PDE, sensitivity analysis, uncertainty quantification, and so on and so on. And basically the idea is that since every programming language only uh, provides like a limited number of operations, such as uh, like some uh, division, sine, cosine, and these things, um, we can easily define for each of those individual operations what the correct derivative is, and then we just need to apply the chain rule to link them all together. And that's sort of a very, very easy concept in theory, and then of course applying this to an actual piece of C code is kind of hard. Okay, and then the other thing I need to introduce is uh, this uh, civil uh, verification tool that, that um, not only are we using, but some of my uh, co-authors are, are actually the, the developers of this tool, um, which is mainly developed for high-performance computing programs, um, and because of that it supports uh, various parallel dialects like MPI, CUDA, OpenMP, um, it uh, works on C programs, but Fortran is in, in progress, and it lets you find things like memory leaks, um, illegal pointer dereferences, but also things like race conditions and, and these sorts of things in a, in a formal way. It's open source if you want to try it out. It's, it's really easy to install as well and, and quite nice to use. And um, what makes Civil really um, useful for us and um, you could say bad in another way is uh, that civil models floating point numbers as real numbers. Um, so 
we, we just assume that there's no round off when we use this tool. And well, this is bad because we can't detect numerical problems, but it's also really useful for us um, because finally we have a way of uh, distinguishing round off errors from other problems. So if Civil says that two programs are equivalent under the assumption that floating point numbers behave like real numbers, then we know that any differences that arise from these pro two programs are only down to round off and nothing else, which uh, helps us a great deal. And this is especially useful for us because in many cases we know that the programs that we are dealing with um, are not using floating point numbers in a sort of reasonable way. So there's there's often no no analysis being done as to which order you should you should sum numbers up to get the uh, smallest round off or something. You just do things in parallel or in whatever way you found the fastest. And then if after the performance optimizations you changed this a bit and indeed changed the result as computed in floating point numbers, that's acceptable to us because we know anyways that, that this is this is what we do. So this this model was really useful for us. And, and that, that is, of course, not to say that it's not useful to also reason about floating point accuracy, but that's something that we, we have intentionally not done in this, in this work. Okay, so let me, let me dive into the first test case. Um, this is actually from, from a mesh adaptation framework. And on the left side, we have a little snippet from a function that, that uh, sort of computes an objective function. And on the right side, we have, the the, we have a function that is supposed to implement the derivative of the left function, and this is used in, in gradient-based optimization. Now, the actual code that would be used in practice is much longer than this. Uh, and, and of course, the, the question now for us is, like, it's, it's really hard to, to specify formally what that left thing does in, in practice, because often it's the result of, sort of uh, several PhD theses and, and all that. Um, but like, we know, and that's the only thing we know, that the right code is supposed to implement the derivative of the left code. Um, so how do we do this? Um, formally, we have, we have in equation one um, the thing that the first function computes. Some alpha is a function of a bunch of coordinates. And what we can do is we can use automatic differentiation to um, generate a second program, um, which I call FD. Um, which takes the same inputs, but instead of just giving us alpha, it gives us the derivative of alpha with respect to all inputs. And then all we have to do is we tell Civil, okay, please uh, use all these inputs, x and y, as unconstrained symbolic inputs, and, and then please compare these two programs and tell us whether they are equivalent. And, um, well, initially they weren't, um, so there, there were couple of um, like differences in error handling and all this, um, but there were also problems that had never been found in testing, um, such as that the, the first program had a bunch of constants in them that were truncated by whoever wrote that code and only used in single precision. And then if you try to, to just test numerically whether one implements the derivative of the other, you would never find this. Um, but but Civil was was able was able to point these problems out to us, and then after after fixing these problems, um, the program two indeed computes the derivative of program A. So that was um, sort of a nice uh, proof of concept. It works. Um, but then, of course, uh, we have a lot uh, more difficult and complex, uh, complex functions that we are dealing with. And um, one thing that we try to verify is a conjugate gradient CG solver, um, which is a very popular and very important method to, you to solve linear equation systems. Um, it's also famously hard to understand, so one of the like, most read and most cited works where this image is actually from um, is called An Introduction to the Conjugate Gradient Method Without the Agonizing Pain which kind of tells you something. And now we're trying to verify that a C implementation of CG that we have is indeed CG. Um, so this is going to be a little bit harder. Um, and uh, CG has all these kind of properties that, that are 
sub subtle or easy to define on a, on a very high and abstract mathematical level, but not evident from the code at all. Um, so so the, way, the way it works is that if you have a solution here, this is just an example in two-dimensional vector space, um, you have a solution here and you're starting from some initial condition, then um, CG starts to uh, identify promising search directions and it will go in that search direction until the difference between this guess and the correct solution is in some sense orthogonal to the to the search direction that it went to. Um, now you have to squint a little bit because they're not orthogonal in the traditional sense, but they're only orthogonal in the space that has been squished by applying this, this matrix to it. So the, the scalar product that defines, this, uh, the, that defines orthogonality is actually defined using this matrix. And there's a nice property to this that um, the residual, so the error that you have after every step is orthogonal to all previous search directions that you took. So in n-dimensional space, if you take n steps, then the remaining error will be orthogonal to n basis vectors in that space, or in other words, it will be zero. So CG is guaranteed to find the correct solution after n iterations. Um, but then, of course, if you look at the code, and this is just pseudocode here, um, then you wouldn't be able to easily tell that this thing there implements a linear solver. So we have a couple of matrix vector products here, we have a couple of dot products, we combine them, sum them up, subtract them in some weird way, and then so if the property that we want to have is that after executing this for n iterations, uh, we found the solution to a linear system. So that's a bit um, harder to verify. Um, and there's a couple of things you could do that. Um, the first thing we've thought of is to just use civil to try and verify that the CG solver that we implemented is equivalent to something simpler, like a Gaussian elimination solver or something. Uh, we have indeed done that and it's in our paper, um, but we've also done a different thing which I want to talk about here, which is to again use AD and uh, the logic behind this um, is not that hard, but maybe a bit um, sort of overwhelming at in the first moment. Um, so if we, if we know that a CG is a correct linear equation system solver, then basically this X that we get after applying CG is equivalent to an X that we would get by just applying the inverse matrix. So then we know that derivative is actually just a linear function, which is equivalent to applying A inverse, which means that der the derivative of the CG solver should just be the inverse matrix A, and that is completely independent of the right-hand side B. So what we're doing is we apply AD to the CG solver, to obtain something that is like a candidate for A inverse, and then multiply that with A and use civil to try and prove that the result of this is the identity matrix for all inputs. And if we are able to do that, uh, then we know that CG is indeed a correct linear solver, which is kind of neat. Um, so we implemented this and uh, hooray, uh, civil was able to do that for um, up to a problem size bound of one by one, um, which is scalar. Um, pretty exciting. And then after some tweaking, we actually managed to push that to two by two matrices, which is a little more exciting maybe, but still not very much. Um, and it turns out, and this is something that was really surprising to, to the developers of, of Civil, um, that the bottleneck is not the state space explosion that, that is usually, like a, I hear, a prime suspect of, of sort of poor performance in these tools. Um, but what we are facing is uh, very large expressions that are building up in CG. And that is because um, in, in each iteration, we sort of multiply the previous result with itself to form some dot product and then keep on doing this. So we actually have an exponential blow up of the expression size that we build up. And, and so in this, in this example here, for, for n equals two, so two by two matrices, we managed to solve it. And for three by three already we can't. And we would only need to go to problem sizes of seven by seven to end up with expressions that have a polynomial degree of more than a million. So it, it really grows very quickly. Um, and it's not just the, the uh, it's not just the civil tool, so we, we try to hand the expression that comes out of the n equals 3 example to, to various other tools, which all didn't manage to, to show that the, the, the expression is what, what we think it is. 
And so um, the friendly civil developers uh, found a way for us to still do something reasonable, which um, I think is quite cool. Uh, just uh, sort of step back from trying to uh, prove the correctness of this definitely, but use a probabilistic method that will prove the correctness of this with very high probability. And the idea is just that if you have a polynomial and you just evaluate it at enough places and you always get zero as a result, then the chance that the polynomial is actually non-zero and you just happen to pick the zero places by chance are quite small because polynomials can only be zero at, at sort of so many places. And, and so as, as a result, um, sort of there's, there's an algorithm that, that we haven't invented ourselves, but I think that we've, we've used for the first time in this kind of application, um, where, where we just uh, probabilistically try to, de to determine whether our program is correct. And actually it only takes sort of a very low number of evaluations to find with a very s uh, small probability of error that our program is correct. And then now we can, we can scale this up to slightly larger problem sizes. Okay, and now I'm just gonna tease for a second uh, the, the third test case that, that we also worked with, um, which is I think uh, very familiar to, to pretty much everyone. Um, we can use finite difference methods to uh, compute an approximation of derivatives of certain functions. Um, so one example would be this formula here, which gives you the second, der second order derivative of the function f around location x0 with an error up to um, h squared. And there's a whole table of these kinds of coefficients to be found in various literatures and, and Wikipedia even. And we've used a similar technique of combining civil and AD to actually verify that the complete uh, finite difference table in, in Wikipedia is correct and has the accuracy that it claims to have. And we intend to, to apply the same method to stencils that are actually uh, implemented in, in much larger pieces of software. So that's just an outlook. And um, yeah, with that, I would like to conclude. Um, so, I mean, the problem remains. Uh, we, we have a little specification and, uh, and, and documentation, um, but we still think that there's some merit in sort of proving uh, certain properties relative to other programs. Um, and the thing that we really need for this are uh, tools that understand things like derivatives, integrals, inverse of matrices or something. Um, the the verification of the CG example in particular would have been a lot easier if verification tools were aware of things like matrices and vectors and we could tell them that, hey, um, this matrix is symmetric positive definite and we're able to actually conclude something useful from it um, or like conclude that a norm has to be positive and all things like this. Um, and uh, yeah, I just want to say that uh, sort of there's, there's good reasons for having different uh, models for floating point numbers um, to be used in different situations, and definitely more work in this space is needed. Uh, so, yeah, with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? So perhaps, uh, can you expand there's, there's a question there. So, uh, in uh, your title, the title contains the term differentiable programs. So, is it just because you're you've used the, the automatic differentiator in uh, these particular examples, or is there something more uh, essential to this um, differentiability in, in your work? Um, I mean yeah, in, in these examples we've, we've used the differentiability so that we can use automatic differentiation to come up with a sort of trusted reference that we wouldn't use in practice but we have more trust in its correctness because it's generated by a tool and not hand optimized by, by a human. So I think the the deeper, uh, the deeper message here would be that um, perhaps there are more situations where, where you can 
find ways of getting trusted references. Maybe through differentiation, maybe you have something that integrates programs, maybe you have some linear algebra package that manages to combine certain partial programs to something that maybe is very inefficient, but you have a reason to trust this. And so, yeah, I, th I think this is, this is what, what we're trying to do here, like find, find other ways of generating programs that, that we trust and that we just use for comparison. Does that answer your question? Uh, thank you. Um, but then makes me think, so the abstract differentiator becomes like the trusted core of your, your verification process. Yes. You, you have to be, be sure that they have been verified. Uh, yes, that's true. And, and AD tools do have bugs occasionally. Um, I guess what, what helps us here is that there's a number of different automatic differentiation tools on the market. So you could think of using a couple of them. Um, and the other thing that perhaps helps us here is that the automatic differentiation tool is hopefully unlikely to commit the exact same mistakes that you committed by manually differentiating the code. Which, which techniques are used within civil to reason about equivalence of program? I don't know, sy symbolic simplification, testing, uh, generating uh, random inputs or uh, no, it's carefully selected inputs? Uh, it's symbolic execution. And then um, yeah, th this, is, this is where the problem starts that I'm an engineer and not a verification person. So they, it, it has ways of making sure that all branches are found. I think it exhaustively tries them all and, and stuff. Okay, thank you. Simplifies path conditions and things like this. <laughs> to, to what extent did HPC constructs actually arise in this? I mean, you, you mentioned you use Civil because it supports things like MPI and and whatnot, but you didn't mention any of this in your in your verification. Was it's was true. Was the fact that, that you're using a tool designed for HPC important to uh, your process? So the examples that I've shown were, were all um, sequential, but the CG solver that we would actually use uses at least OpenMP and reductions to, to perform the dot products and matrix vector products. But all the... All these constructs are so simple that Civil can immediately Im eliminate them and show that they're equivalent to a sequential code, and they didn't play any further role in, in this particular verification. But, but it is important for us that Civil does these things because most of our actual codes contain these constructs. So let's uh, thank Jan again. Okay.